So today here at the Documentary Media Centre, I'm catching up with a, a good friend of mine, Dr. Paul Riley, Paul, um, but also the researcher in residence here at the Documentary Media Centre, which is, a, which is a, a great role that you've got. And you've been very supportive in lots of things that we've done over the, sort of the last 12 to 18 months that roles existed. So that's great. So how are you? How's, how's life with you in lockdown? In lockdown. Yeah. Deja vu. Yeah. Oh, not bad. Thanks, John. And, and yourself getting used to it. Yeah. I'm not sure whether we can call it lockdown anymore. It's that kind of, are we in lockdown? Are we out of lockdown? So yeah. Semi-lockdown. I don't Semi -lockdown. know. Partial lockdown. Yeah. I'm sure we've still not declared being out of lockdown ever in Leicester. So I think we've been locked down for two years now, but there we go. Sort of, uh, all, it's all water that's flowing under the bridge <laughs> every day, isn't it? So with lots of other stuff going on in the political sphere and all sorts of stuff, which brings us nicely to your, to your book now uh, a year ago wasn't it i mean it's the 19th wasn't it there was it the 19th of, of january last 19th, year yeah. your book digital contention in a divided society was formally launched and i was uh, very honored to have the opportunity to talk to you about it as well with your manchester um university press launch as well which i thought went very well actually some very interesting comments from your colleagues uh, around the world as well and some other bits and pieces that we've done about it so what, what what's your feeling now a year on i mean these things take a long time to write don't they and i know you were talking about the uh, union flag protest in 2012 to march 13 and then the ardoin parade disputes 14 15 so it's taken a while to get it into into print and then sort of a year later is it a long enough time to reflect back on comments and stuff yeah i mean i i think it's probably the the fact that a lot of the themes from well what i mean it's almost historic now so we're coming to a decade since the, the first time i was collecting data and analyzing data about this but it's the fact that the same themes keep emerging about division yeah about amplifying hate speech about mis and disinformation you know i mean some of the stuff i was looking at before we had trump and brexit so perhaps on a, on a different scale very often quite crude and in, in the book a lot of the examples are very crude crude photoshopping you know people sharing rumors without any you know verification of what they were sharing a lot of these things are still there and, and i think probably in the last 12 months since the book was published, you know, we had the uh, the so-called Brexit riots. I mean, the, the label's a bit misleading, but we had in April of last year more violence being blamed on social media platforms, on messages coming out from false flag accounts, accounts which were anonymous or purporting to be someone that they're not, where we see social media again being blamed, but also being used by people to respond. And I think that's the big thing I reflect back on now is that we have this notion that social media drives events and in some cases it clearly does but for most it's how we react you know it's a machine you know that generates anger anxiety rage sometimes joy and we've seen that over the pandemic that in a lot of controversial things people turn to social media not just to get information or to share news but to share their anger or emotion and i think that's something which keeps coming back into these discussions well i'm thinking you know, to kind of benchmark that or, or timeline it completely to sort of yesterday maybe more than today mm -hmm. um y yesterday physically yesterday not not just in the past but yesterday with the whole um sort of you know party gate situation that the prime minister finds himself in and and people's reactions to that with sharing their own stories and their own information and particularly last night with rory kinnear with his piece yeah. i think it was in was it in the times i think it was just saying that on that day kind of like you know he, he buried his sister and went for a walk, told a neighbour and then went back to his house why this was going on. That kind of stuff is, um, it's not just then an opinion about what's happened or the individual. Hmm. That's, that's almost, a, they said it was kind of a, a, quite a calm step back, talking at the, looking at the thing whole holistically, which is, you know, collectively everybody was in this boat, but quite clearly there were some that were more on the champagne yacht rather than in, in, in the boat. It's experience. I mean, I, I, mean, I think this... Again, it, it's a weird thing to write about something which is a decade ago. And obviously thinking about a book like that, you're right. It, it's, it's dated by the, by the time that elapses between, you know, the things happening, the research being conducted, and then when you publish it. But there are similar similar experiences there. And I, and I think what I kind of take from it, and this applies to, to not just Northern Ireland, but in, in general, is that we react in the moment uh, to things. Again, if, if you're on Twitter, that's probably the point of you being on it. You know, you will follow things, but, you know, it encourages you to say what you feel an immediate response to it. So yesterday you have people sharing, you know, quite 
justifiable anger at what they saw as hypocrisy from those who made the rules not following them while they'd had to and had to suffer and endure you know a lot of trauma and loss but also you have yeah i think the idea about a year on when people come back to it i mean if we all looked at what we post on social media 12 months on i dare say most of us would go i'm probably didn't really think that through or perhaps I didn't know things that I know now and I think there's an element where almost when you're writing a book you have that by default when you come to publish it you know more about what happened through other sources in 2019 you did in 2013 and I think those things sort of seem keep coming back to in terms of my research work but also my experience of social media generally which I'm sure you do too. Yeah, I guess that's that's an interesting point you make there, isn't it? Because the, the challenge really is when you're writing about something from 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, and then you're coming up to publish it in 2020, 2021, then, you know, you've had, you know, something like Donald Trump or Brexit since 2016. Mm-hmm. You're, you've almost got to write it in isolation where you're not using the examples that you've got with something like Trump and Brexit as a way yeah. of explaining why people would have used it then, because it's oh now it becomes obvious. And this kind of makes me think about this point really, that if we were to take your book now and get rid of those two specific references to those, to those um, dates and refer- uh, uh, events, and were to center it in 2020 oh, and John, 2020. Yeah, okay. Can you still hear me now? Are you there? Oh, you're back. Yep, you're back. There yeah. you go. That's cool. Yeah, you froze. You froze my end. So yeah, sorry about that. You froze um, my end too. Don't worry. Okay. You were mid-flow. Don't worry. There we go. We we'll go back again. So I mean, your book. If you were to take out the the flag protests and and the parade disputes and substitute it for two events, say you know that had happened last year or this year, then it will be interesting to see what the similarity is and what the reaction has been from maybe like you know the ordinary citizen this kind of silly citizenship that you that you put in the book which i think is a fascinating concept people's ability to create memes and parody uh, things that happen as uh, as well do you do you think it's when you look back now it was of its time those, those those two incidents or do you now see that that just being a pattern that's formed itself through what you see now and look into the future is something that people are just using social media in that way now I think it's a cycle, you know, and again, I, I think I would, you're always careful not to generalize, you know, based on, on past events, but they do tell us things about, about how people react particularly. And I, and I think what you could perhaps replace, you know, a contentious parade or protest in Northern Ireland, um, sadly, because these things do reoccur quite frequently, not perhaps annually. And I, and I think in a, in a bizarre way, the pandemic meant that there could not be large you know orange order parades going through areas where perhaps there was some contention about them so we've had to a certain extent over the last few years perhaps a break from that cycle but but i dare say that when it comes to future parades similar things will occur and and i think probably what you have when you made the point earlier on about it's very often the, the loudest most vocal people who dominate online conversations they're very rarely representative of what wider society thinks. And again, when I think back to the, the book and the period where I was researching at that time, I mean, you were talking about probably less than 20% of, of people in Northern Ireland, according to Ofcom or the ONS, were using Twitter. And of that, how many of them were probably following a contentious parade? Probably very few. So I think we often kind of get distracted by a lot of noise when that noise is probably generated by, by very few, very active, always partisan accounts. And I could probably take that from Northern Ireland, yeah, through to Brexit, through to last night, what's happening now in terms of, you know, the, the so-called work party and bring your own booze, that very often the loudest, most angry, most listened to voices are not representative of opinion. I'd probably say last night, maybe they are. That's the caveat, because I think there is a lot of anger out there, which we are seeing about via other sources. And that issue about representation, I think Twitter, it's very problematic to say it's a proxy for public opinion, but certainly sometimes it does reflect that. And I think we do see that recently. Mm-hmm. Now, what we've got at the moment as well with, with, with social media, it seems to be more and more, doesn't it, um, it being used this way is, I think, you know, yesterday it was... Um, Angela Rayner's uh, appearance on Sky News was pretty much uh, pulled apart 
because of her sort of, you know, grammar and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, the way that she was talking and what she was saying, talking about the prime minister. So not what she was saying, but the way that she was saying and that she's kind of, you know, from from Stockport and, sort of, you know, from from sort of, you know, work, the working class right through to, you know, the DUP's Diane Dodds um, Twitter incident that was reported to the uh, to the um, Garda uh, about um, sort of, you know, her son that had died, you know, what I mean, sort of in the past. Uh, that, that used as a weak point as a way of attacking people so it's almost that death um, by you know sort of uh, wounding by a thousand cuts if you like so not holding them to account just on on a platform where they're comfortable but constantly sniping at them all the time seems to be quite a prevalent thing now doesn't it in in, in all politics globally as well yeah i mean it, it's that sort of you're right it's almost like we've weaponized in the past i mean you can see it as I've, I mean, I've an extreme example in terms of a society like Northern Ireland, where there is division and conflict in, the, in its recent past. That uh, I mean, certainly the incident being referred to, uh, you know, about uh, the incident involving Dan Dodds and Nigel Dodds' son um, and that attack. I mean, it was thirty years before that tweet was posted. What's interesting about that, I suppose, is that. But with with that account, you know, we have a lot of um, controversy there about whether Twitter should have removed it when it was reported. I mean, people have reported it and Twitter haven't taken action against it because it, uh, presumably it falls down the gaps in terms of, you know, not being hate speech or a direct threat. Yeah. Uh, but you also have this notion again about where social media is almost being, it's almost being turned in against users. So Dan Dodds is on there as a politician, whether you agree or disagree with her politics and I'm sure there are plenty of people who do use Twitter to hold politicians to account while others have a go at them. There's still an element where I think it was fair to say there was widespread condemnation from all parts of Northern Irish society about that particular tweet. Whether or not the person who posted it is held accountable, we'll have to see. I think it's interesting, yeah, the Garda are involved, which again would indicate that the person who shared that message was from the Republic of Ireland, not Northern Ireland, so jurisdictionally. But it does sort of point to this, this idea that people do have a target on their back um, in terms of social media. But if you're out there as a public figure, uh, whether it's a politician, an academic or a celebrity, and you say anything, there's going to be people who, for whatever reason, decide to play you, not what you say. And, and I think that's something which unfortunately is a feature of politics everywhere i, I guess think. it's a, i guess it's a studs up sliding tackle in football isn't it? Mm, you know I mean? yeah. <laughs> you've played the person rather than the ball um is it is an interesting one for you it just came into my mind as you were talking about that there was do you think also that ultimately you know everybody wants the status quo we all advocate for change and we want our person to be in charge and we don't want their person that kind of, you know, that, that divisive language that, you know, social media is very good at amplifying that. Do you think sometimes both sides agree behind the scenes, whoever they, those people are, whoever mm -hmm. they are, that actually it's getting a little bit out of hand. So we've almost got to do something that's quite extreme as a way of being able to allow us all to condemn that, to kind of reboot, the, the reboot the status quo. There's probably a performance element to a lot of this. I mean, I, I think, I mean, you'd like to think that was only politicians or you know public <laughs> figures, but I, yeah. I think, I mean, if, if we think about how we all use social media to an extent, we are selective in what we say and what we share. And, and I think there's an element where, you know, it is a front stage, backstage thing. I mean, I, mean, I, I do, you know, I do acknowledge that certainly with Twitter storms, to use a very crude term, there are people who will go out of their way to be offended by things and to share it knowing that the audience that they're wanting to cultivate agree with them. And there are obviously people who do benefit from negative um, publicity and attention. And, and a way of doing that is to say controversial things constantly uh, because that draws traffic. And yes, there's ways that people monetize that. So yeah, I think there is an element where people are, are not their authentic selves, or at least not fully, when they do tweet or say things in online domains, which they know are public. Um, whether or not that applies in every case, I don't know. I think there are people who do probably have hateful beliefs, who do think they can probably say them and get away with it, and probably do get away with it. Because, you know, we do, even though Twitter, Facebook, and other ones say they tackle hate speech and take it seriously, they don't really. 
And, and again, there's a reason for that. They want the clicks, the likes, the engagement. Why would you stop a potential revenue stream by removing all content, which is controversial? Probably guess, too much to ask. Yeah, and I guess that's why people like, you know, Trump, Katie Hopkins, Nigel Farage, Piers Morgan, if you like, the, the people that have dragged, um, am I allowed to use that term? Dragged, yeah. uh, dragged some of the uh, uh, issues that are important you know, that ultimately should be debated and, and talked about in, in a political sphere and maybe a more media sphere have been dragged into that sort of infotainment, entertainment uh, part where suddenly, you know, you're expecting them, Jeremy Clarkson, for example, you're expecting them to say something controversial in order to then create this artificial Twitter storm. Do, do we have in somewhere like Northern Ireland's political situation, because ultimately that those divisions, you know, they're, they're long held, they're entrenched, you know, they're not going to go anywhere soon. And there's many uh, examples of that, I guess, globally as well, isn't there, with borders or disputes and Kashmir and places like that, Palestine. They're, they're never, you never seem to get the impression they're going to be solved through politics. But at the same time, that's the only way it's ever going to be be dealt with when something concrete's done. But it always plays out on social media and it's beneficial because you can learn something, you can identify with, find people that are on the ground, engage with them meaningfully, but mm. no matter how much of that you do, it'll always be something that someone says, does, or is misinterpreted, which is the thing that will blow up. I think, I mean, there, there's a age old phrase, I can't remember who said it, but it may have been about people like you just described where it was controversial views they hold for money. Which again suggests again that people are fully aware that what they're saying is not really what they believe or not accurate. But so they're kind of on brand, if you like. They're, they're kind of enhancing yeah. their own brand. Yeah, you know, it's 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 a personal branding thing, and and it's it's almost yeah, it is courting controversy. I mean, I I think probably the the, the question um, I would have about this, and it's not one I probably have an answer to yet, because I do flip between this, is that if you take the the attitude that people having a voice is important. And I think most people who use social media would say that is true. Um, that with that, you have the issue, but well, who polices what is acceptable or unacceptable? I mean, you can clearly say hate speech is wrong, but when people don't use hate speech, but say offensive things, there is a question there, who draws that line? And I think we're not really there yet in terms of social media platforms will only go so far in terms of what they say they will take action on and they rely on us as users to report so again they do not proactively filter they publish and then they wait for us to say that's wrong and to remove it um, by and large we have politicians who try to regulate that but then of course for a lot of people would you want some of the politicians in the current uk government to make decisions on what is acceptable or unacceptable probably some people would think that was also problematic and then we have us and again, I do come back to that issue about I think it's a good thing that people, groups in Northern Ireland who were not represented during the Troubles or even post-Troubles periods in the news media have a voice to say how they feel. I think that is broadly a good thing. I think the problem is when they're saying things where there are clear uh, breaches of what Musi would say are offensive language or hate speech, or in, in case of Northern Ireland, people who obviously do glorify the troubles and the conflict itself, many of whom did not live through it. And there are obviously question marks there about, well, should they not be getting challenged on these views? But how do you challenge someone on social media in a way which doesn't antagonize? Mm. If you and I knew the answer to that, we'd be very rich men. Yeah, like yeah. Or, or we'd have our own platform maybe, but yeah, one of, one yes, of the Yes, yeah. exactly. I mean, yeah. it's that kind of it's that kind of issue again where it's easy to say just stop that speech, just say no to that. But I don't think that solves the problem. And again, I was I've been doing a bit of research in Scotland, which has a lot of crossover with the stuff I did in the book. Um, funnily enough, about parades and about you know football culture, you know, about masculine cultures and about mm -hmm. sectarianism. If you decide to push people off Twitter, but like Trump, they go somewhere else. You know, people don't stop thinking those things or believing those things or saying those things just because you deny them a platform. They usually go to some other platform, which may be even more obscure, where they're likely to talk to only like-minded people and become more entrenched, not less. And I do think there's that with projects that you do, John, for example, we need to have that dialogue. I mean, how you have that dialogue where it's respectful, I'm not antagonistic 
is a tricky problem for us all, but it's something we have to think of a solution to. And I know they said that, you know, Trump being banned from Twitter, you know, helped his fundraising efforts. Um, mm. And all right, you might have silenced him on, you know, a, a, a very popular platform, but at least you know where he is. You know what I mean? You're, you're mm. kind of keeping him in the light, if you like, you know, and if, you know, if we're going to go down that, you know, the only way, you know, darkness exists, if, you know, you know people don't do things and, you know, evil you know, triumphs and stuff, all that, that great quote, whoever it was, um, it, 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 by keeping people in the light, at least, you know, where they are, you know, what I mean, the, some of the people yeah. I mentioned earlier, you know, where are they now? What are they, what are their main platforms, you know, and you'd like to think to yourself, well, if anybody that's, responsive to any of this stuff you know starts getting radicalized you know and of course it's not just the religious extremists anymore now we're talking about you know people that just believe in white power being radicalized and we've seen that in america with what with the 6th of january um storming of the capital that suddenly as people feel emboldened and stuff what you have to do whether you like what they're saying or not you have to kind of keep them in the light in order to be able to at least understand why they're doing that um, and, you know, while you're getting angry and upset about it, you're hoping that the authorities are also using those same platforms to keep an eye on them, but also to, to look at the other channels where they're communicating things through them. I, mean, yeah. I noticed you sent me some links through as well about Northern Ireland about, um, you know, during the, the kind of the Brexit, the Brexit riot, so-called. Um, and it was just saying about on both sides, isn't it? Come out and, you know, stand up, you know, call, call into arms and things like this. It's still that. <laughs> A generation that has no witness or wasn't witnessed of the of the actual troubles that's being played as a way of coming out and standing up and you go well what are you coming out and standing up for exactly and again it, it's where those messages are coming from i mean it, it's it's easy to it's easy to dismiss it as it's it's young people who did not experience the conflict war i found there is an element of that i'm sure but I mean, what you have found that is obviously there's a more sinister element to it where it is obviously people who are fully aware of what that what that experience was like, but who are manipulating younger people via those sorts of channels where they know young people do tend to hang out more like WhatsApp and, and obviously other platforms to do that. And, and I think there's, you're right, that issue about conspiracy theory and stuff like that. I mean, research you know, generally does tend to say that it's not as simple as just putting a wall up whether it's to say you can't do that or to say you're wrong. If you tell someone they're wrong and they firmly believe something, they don't just decide to take a different route because you've said that, you know, I think there, there has to be an, I mean, dialogue is, is crucial to that. I think probably restoring some sort of trust in, in institutions, whether it's the media or politicians is also an important part of that. And clearly we're not there based on what we've seen in the last couple of months, whether it's in the UK or elsewhere. I mean, there are clearly some, clear issues of lack of trust in politicians uh, i think probably with good reason given some of their activities and there is that issue again where if you just denigrate the media politicians any institution which you get information from you do kind of end up in a situation where people believe covid 19 is a conspiracy or a hoax and you know that they don't need vaccinated and that you know there's you know microchips and vaccines etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think that kind of applies whether it's Northern Ireland or a different context that you have that kind of division baked in and social media amplifies that you made the point earlier on you know it amplifies the worst elements it can amplify good things but it also amplifies the worst parts of us too okay so one final point that I wanted uh, to, to ask you about um, was kind of the, the concept of peace talks because obviously mm -hmm. when all the the negotiations were going on uh, for sort of peace building in, in Northern Ireland and stuff, you know, social media wasn't really a thing, you know what I mean? It wasn't kind of around, was it? So um, you kind of had to attend a meeting <laughs> rather yeah. than, uh, than, jo than join a Zoom call or a, a live stream on YouTube, which is quite interesting. And I was reading an article and it was saying about some of the peace talks, particularly uh, in, in, in North Africa, that was the example they, that they were using, was that all the progress that they were making inside the peace talks were being undone literally by the time they'd packed away, stood up and walked out the door by the very people participating in the peace talks, leaking mm -hmm. everything and then countering what was being said. So literally the peace, the peace speakers, if you like, the people in the talk walked out to a reaction to what they'd just agreed. So they said it wasn't sort of nefarious forces on the outside. It was actually people within 
the actual peace talks themselves, the supporters that were doing this. What kind of impact do you think something like that would have had at the time? Would we have got an agreement, do you think? Or, you know, would we have even got to anything being signed? Or do you think it literally was because it was out of sight and out of mind of, of, of the public and was done behind closed doors between both sides that they were almost able to, I mean, it fell apart, didn't it, with Stormont and stuff like that, I know, but, you know, and the, and the, and the assembly, but do you think it would even have got to that point if it was today with social media? That's a really good question. I mean, I, I think, I mean, there ha I mean, I, I know that Paddy Hoy, for example, has written about this and, and a constant sort of recurring point, and maybe it's not an easy question to answer, is would there have been a peace process if we had had some of the atrocities, some of the contentious parades, some of the political contention playing out online at the same time as this? I mean, my sort of feeling on it, I mean, again, there are things we can take from, from Brexit in this in terms of there is no such thing as a confidential negotiation anymore. Yeah, yeah. That's well, because, that's where we'll pass that, aren't we? <laughs> you know, so so ultimately, I mean, I think there, there, to an extent, I mean, during the, the negotiations leading up to the Belfast Agreement, there, there were, you know, examples of strategic leaking, if you like. Mm. You know, so there was an element where on the Unis side in particular, they were obviously wanting to, to pave the way for things which would be uncomfortable for the, the electorate who would vote in the referendum. So there was an element of that, but you're right to say it was more controlled and involved relations with journalists. I mean, the, the three main newspapers in Northern Ireland, you know, the Irish News, Belfast Telegraph and Newsletter, were all pro agreement. So that helped. So obviously when they came to the referendum, they were also <laughs> pro. There wasn't a newspaper saying we shouldn't do this. Like we did see with Brexit with some newspapers on either side of that debate. I think what you have now is, is a, a culture perhaps where not just politicians, but those aides and people close to them are able to, to, to weaponize social media in that way, which isn't necessarily to build agreement or consensus. It's part of the partisan game. It's part of divide and conquer. And yeah, Brexit is, is a, an obvious thing to go to in this, that all we heard in the negotiations, perhaps in 2019, 2020, were the UK side posturing saying that they were going to do this that and the other and the eu side saying something different and that was intentional it was obviously part of how saying to a journalist anonymous source said this and using digital technology to do it uh, gives you a degree of clean hands when it comes to who's to blame if it doesn't work and i do wonder particularly when things were so raw during the troubles in the 80s and 90s you know Early 90s, obviously, heading up to the peace negotiations, which were obviously a couple of years in, in making. Would you have had the Shankill bomb, grey steel, atrocities like that in a skill and as far back as 87? Yeah, yeah. I can't imagine people taking to social media to ask for calm heads, to ask yeah. for political leaders. There was, at the time, people did speak out and say, we need to have peace, we need to negotiate, we need to stop the conflict. I do worry that if you had citizens now with the power to broadcast what they think so readily, would you have had no political appetite to talk to the other side? And I suppose you could apply it to Africa, you could apply it to any conflict now, that yeah. it's almost like a different theatre where if you're an elite or a policymaker or someone at the table, you have to almost consider, well, what's being said there, even though that might not be a representative sample of what your population think you almost have that sort of delicate manoeuvring around that. And I do sort of worry that, again, the balance here is you want people to have a voice, but you also have to have political leadership too. You know, at some point, political leaders have to lead. They can't just always follow. And I think that's something which Northern Ireland now still has a problem with. There's a democratic deficit. There's still an issue there with, I think, particularly on the Unis side, that politicians do not effectively represent their constituents and to a large extent are not held accountable for not doing that. And I think that's something which we need to improve the quality of democracy. And that will maybe address some of the issues about how social media does amplify very negative, bad trends the way it does. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating. One, one final point, mate, that just popped into my mind when you were talking about that, actually, that... You know, you were talking there about sort of 2012 to, to 2015 with the Union flag protests and the Ardine uh, parade disputes. And 
you know, how social media has been used to, you know, play that out in a sort of positive and a negative way and mm. that misinformation and disinformation. If you were to write a similar book um, about, you know, England, Scotland and Wales and how that's played out with mm. the vaccine, for example, you know, lockdown, different restrictions, you know, people still being in lockdown, for example, in Wales, um, part COVID passports and stuff and you know it it kind of being open in England do you see something like you know four or five years time uh, maybe after the next election uh, you know as, as a lot more discontent if you like uh, rather than sort of people being together about something I mean it only takes one or two issues doesn't it uh, that suddenly you could write a similar book around how social media is used between mm. England, Scotland and Wales, uh, but writing specifically about something like, you know, the COVID vaccine restrictions. Uh, would it, do you think something like that will, would play out as well? Do you, would you see from your colleagues that you know, or, you know, your own observations that, you know, there are people in Wales and people in Scotland that are using social media in that way to go for cessation or, you know, independence, for example, in Scotland? I think so. I mean, I think the, the big thing is that, I mean, it's easy to say that Brexit or COVID caused the division. I think the division was always there. You know, I, I think what... It's a bit like frost, pre- isn't it? Those cracks were already there. It's, yeah. just the, it's the frost that opens them up sometimes. It's, it, it is almost that kind of, I mean, again, it, it's almost like I would ask who benefits from saying it's those issues which cause the division. And that's probably politicians. I mean, you know, it's not that long ago we were talking about expenses scandals and about Iraq and about reasons why people had very good reason not to trust their political leaders and very good reason to, to actually believe the opposite of what they were being told, whether the prime minister was Blair or whether it was Johnson. There are reasons why people have turned away from it. That's dangerous because I think it does lead to a situation Well, if people start effectively saying, well, we don't why would we vote no point in it so they don't believe in democracy anymore then obviously the the net result of that is that you have fewer people voting you have you have know, politicians taking power on, on less than 25 percent of the total number of people who could have voted and you create bigger disillusionment disenchantment and yes perhaps the grounds for people to feel that they don't really want to abide by laws passed by politicians during a pandemic or that they don't really see the need to follow restrictions or guidance or measures that are put in place for their safety because why would they and i do sort of wonder i mean with the current state of the uk you know it's it's very easy to envisage that the uk will not exist in 10 or 15 years time as a result of a trend which has been ongoing for 20 years not two but it's clearly been exacerbated. We see, look at Scotland, Wales compared to England in terms of COVID measures. Prime example, I think that we see that sort of issue where there are clear differences in approach. And, and again, they do not seem to be harmonious at all. So I do wonder whether you would get um, perhaps people using social media with the view to in scotland i think it's, it's quite clear that there are more people now who would vote for independence than there were in 2014 wheels it's harder to guess and i suppose the question is still would people actually make a radical change i don't know i kind of wonder whether again those on twitter who are hashtagging scottish independence it's pretty obvious where they lie on the issue but then where are the people who they need to convince to do it they're probably not on twitter or if they are, they're probably not looking at hashtags like that. They're probably somewhere else. And I think we probably have to always think of those voices that aren't visible on those platforms before we suggest social media has a really dominant influence. I think it reflects, perhaps it distorts, but I, I don't think it drives the way people often think it does. And that's because- So it Paul, reflects one end. It reflects one- yeah extreme version yeah. or opinion about something it doesn't take into account the mass so it's those people being able to convince the mass in order to make that change if you like it yeah i mean i think i mean does moderate politics do well on social media i mean again i would probably suggest no i mean again i don't see a lot of lib dem hashtags trending compared to ones which are pro brexit or pro remain you yeah. know I, I, extreme positions are i mean maybe it's that issue about about selling you know 
an extreme position is perhaps more likely to get attention than a moderate one. Mm. And that's again a reflection of a trend which goes beyond Brexit, but clearly Brexit has exacerbated it. And I think the pandemic on top of Brexit, you have a lot of people who are very disillusioned and are looking for a, perhaps an alternative. Whether or not that alternative is out there, I don't know. I want, don't want to sound pessimistic, but you might make a case that all politicians have let members of the public down during the pandemic in one way or another, whether it's breaking their own rules or doing other things which they shouldn't have been doing. Yeah. Well, listen, mate, congratulations on the book again. You know, it's a year on. It's nice to be catching up with you again about it. What's what's in the pipeline? What's next for um, your kind of Northern Ireland research? I'm working on a, on a project with uh, Victoria Basket from Sheffield University where we're, we're doing some analysis on the uh, Brexit riots and, and Twitter responses to it. And so far, you know, we're early doors, but we're finding some interesting findings where shock our Brexit riot hashtag is all about Boris Johnson and not really about Northern Ireland at all. It's more about Brexit as an issue. And a lot of people saying, I told you so. Who would have thought on social media people would say, I told you so. Uh -huh. So yeah, there's an element of that. We're going to try and get that out this year. Um, obviously, um, I'd like to get the book out to paperback and hopefully uh, update it to reflect that, you know, again, a very recent event. And I'm also working on a project looking at sectarianism and uh, social media in Scotland, where there's a lot of crossover in this. So hopefully I'll be out in the next 12 months too. Brilliant. And also next week, we've, we've got a scheduled interview as well, haven't we, about your Instagram project, which I know we've done a couple of interviews about. So I'll, we'll put, I'll put links to the, the previous interviews that we've done as well for both of these. But next week, I'm looking forward to catching up about that Instagram uh, project and the research that you did there. Yeah, some interesting findings that obviously will follow up on what we spoke about before. You know, some really interesting themes, some really interesting images of, of conflict, but of soldiers and of, of members of the public. So looking forward to that. Yeah, excellent. Thanks very much. Cheers, John.